Good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Harvey, and I am pleased to be your um, Associate Vice President for Advancement here at Mary Baldwin. Welcome back to the Hills of Stanton for this evening's very special presentation from our president, Dr. Pamela R. Fox. Um, tonight, she will lead us through a wonderful um, story, if you will, of the many faces and, and times through this university's history. We're very honored to have her speak with us this evening. Um, just a few housekeeping things um, as we get started. Please keep yourselves on mute unless, um, unless it's your turn to speak. Um, please raise your hand if you'd like to speak. There will be time for questions at the end, but this is fairly interactive. There'll be some polls, so look out for those for sure. Um, be thinking about your favorite Mary Baldwin history or factoids or memories. Um, we'll hope to touch on some of those this evening. Um, and if there are any questions that you have throughout the uh, presentation, please utilize the chat. I'll be watching that. If you have any technical difficulties, let me know through chat over here on the right side. And um, without further ado, I'd love to introduce you to, of course, you know her, Pamela Fox. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, everybody. I'm just sitting here in delight watching so many friends so happy to be with so, so many of you again tonight and and thank you for joining us this evening. It is a special privilege for me and a humble one to share some of the incredible love and study that I've taken about our beloved Mary Baldwin's history over these past 20 years. So I want to share my screen with you first. Let me do that. <clears throat> Are we good? Great. So this week we titled this Mary Baldwin's Rich History. And I wanted to start actually with, with the histories here. And just to tell you, most of you know that I am his, an historian, although I usually focus it on being a music historian, but an historian nonetheless. And when the search firm was contacting me in early 2003 about the position of the presidency at Mary Baldwin, they sent me a lot of things. They sent me a bunch of folders and flyers and academic brochures, but I said, I really would like to read the history of the college. So the first thing that they sent to me, of course, was Pat Meggs to live in time. Well, I read the whole thing uh, over a two day period and said, well, yes, I'm very intrigued by this. So that was that Pat Meggs book was a big factor in bringing me along to the interview. And then after that, I started reading in order. I hope all of you have read these, but then with, with um, Mr. Waddell's history of the seminary, of course, which takes us up to 1905, and then picking up with the big Alice Waters book, which is an absolutely, absolutely impressive, rich source that goes all the way through um, the institution centennial in 1942 and actually concludes with the address of President Jarman about the first century of Mary Baldwin. And there's so much, so much in there. So many primary sources are incorporated into it. And then, of course, Dr. Mink took up to live in time. And, and following that, she wrote a retrospect on the Tyson years. So we have our pillars of history here. And underneath them, when we took this photograph, we put the blue stockings, knowing that we have that great documentary. We have other resources, you know, from the Alumni Association and, of course, our own magazines but a really rich documentation of history. I started to do some writing myself. I'm doing it in several different ways. Part one way that I'm writing is a little bit more personal about what happened in the dining room of the president's house. Some fairly interesting decisions happened. This year. I have sort of in the dining room chapter, and then I have some other chapters that take themes like the history of the arts, actually the history of the Alumni Association, because we don't have a fully documented history of the Alumni Association. So for me, obviously, the, the, the great love that I have for our history is it's its strength across the ages, I mean, its fortitude that it displays, it's the continuity of character, of no matter when a woman or a man attended Mary Baldwin, there is this constancy of character and an unwavering sense of purpose and mission, even though the words in the mission statements may have changed. It's still that per the people who need 
and will most benefit from the education, the personalized transforming education for lives of purpose and professional success that Mary Baldwin can give. So it meant a lot to me to ground my leadership in these deep roots and to keep weaving the fact that our traditions and our history are the forces, the living forces that animate the present. They are our thread of continuity. So for what, those are some of the reasons why Mary Baldwin's history is so important to me. So put this in your minds right now, because at the end, we're going to come back and I'm going to ask you, what does the rich Mary Baldwin history mean to you? So you can start thinking about that now. As we go forward here, I should have said before I changed the slide, if you have a question, any question, pop it in the chat. This does not have to be a narrative. Uh, there'll be a couple of times where I, I ask you, I'll say the first five hands for this and then put your hands up and we'll have some dialogue. So we certainly ground this sense of continuity in our motto, both in its earlier um, 20th century, not for time, but eternity, and then, of course, in its Latin depiction on our current seal. But that sense of continuity, the sense of timelessness that is also timely, really, really undergirds, undergirds um, how we look at our past. So we have our founders, of course, Ms. Bailey, and I wish we had something other from Mary Julia Baldwin than the sketch, but of course, this is what we have from her. But this is a sacred week at Mary Baldwin. So this is why we scheduled the first of these virtual engagement opportunities for tonight. Because of course, it yesterday was Mary Julia Baldwin's birthday. And I hadn't found this before, this photo from 1936, where not only did they make a beautiful cake for Mary Julia, but they obviously dressed up beautifully and celebrated themselves as well. So we went, yesterday was Apple Day. Apple Day happened to fall on Mary Julia Baldwin's 193rd birthday. So when we had assembled all of the apples in the orchard, here's what we did. Happy birthday, Mary Julia! <laughs> And, and so in that assembly there, you can't see her right now, but we've been going to the orchard of a 2011 graduate, Kara Jenkins, for several years, Woodbine Farms up by Winchester. She was there, and as it happens, she's also a devotee of Mary Baldwin history. Her son, William, was born on Mary Julia Baldwin's birthday one year ago. So he was there with us for that very special celebration. And of course, tomorrow, this leads us right into Founders Day, where our seniors are invested. Some pictures of Founders Day here across time, both when held for in the chapel uh, that doesn't exist anymore, of course, where we came out of the administration building and went into First Presbyterian Church. And now we've been having it on Page Terrace, which it seems we'll have lovely weather to have our Founders Day celebration tomorrow. So as I myself try to organize uh, and think about our history, there's two ways that I really do it, and they're complementary. The first is obviously that we've had four names over our 181 years. So that helps you give you the main historical chunks from the Augusta Female Seminary to the Mary Baldwin Seminary, and then from Mary Baldwin College to Mary Baldwin University. And just to give Dan a plug, I think of all the pumpkin displays he's ever done, the spelling out all the names in the year of the 175th anniversary was really the best, even though he's outdone himself. And rumor has it that this year's pumpkin display, which will be his last, is not to be missed. We carried 120 pumpkins home yesterday from Woodbine Farms. And there will be great carving and look out for it. There will be a great display. So we think about the names and then we think about how, how our programmatic innovation, to whom have we extended the mission of Mary Baldwin and what are the special and signature programs? So obviously from the founding of the seminary, important point, in fact, the seminal point in probably our whole history when Mary Julia Baldwin herself came back during the Civil War to take over um, the seminary and the her efforts, which I'll talk about in a little bit, to really improve the position of this of the school with a conservatory of music, introducing university courses, i.e. baccalaureate courses, moving into a formal designation of a junior college and then to a four year baccalaureate college. 
and then an intense series of evolutions and extensions of our mission in the 1970s to adult women and men, to exchange students from the program for the exceptionally gifted, first graduate degrees, V. Will, Shakespeare and performance, and then more recently, since I've been the president with the Spencer Center for Civic and Global Engagement and welcoming the Heifetz International Music Institute, and of course, the establishment of the College of Health Sciences, becoming a university, becoming co-educational, launching new graduate programs, and now our new organization around colleges and schools and a center for student success. So the four names of, this, of the institution, the series of programmatic in innovations. But I also like to think about this, you know, in terms of larger chunks of time, about the innovative traditions and the entrepreneurial cycles. And sometimes these cycles are all are caused by a crisis that takes us inward and makes us go further. So we start, of course, with the founding of the Augusta Female Seminary with Rufus Bailey and his family. They started in rented rooms in 1842, and they started classes. They had 15 students. And of course, as you well know, <clears throat> in that first class in September of 1842 was the 12 year old Mary Julia Baldwin, who was an orphan living with relatives here in Stanton. And then by the 1844, they were able, he was able to obtain the land and build the center portion of the administration building. And really, I think build an exceptional curriculum. I like a lot the fact that he was uh, putting his philosophy forward. He wrote them in letters to his daughters, and these are all really beautiful letters. But all throughout my presidency, I've been drawn to this quote, for the education of women is more important than for men. The place a woman occupies in society and the influence she exerts, exerts require the most complete moral and intellectual education. Here are my two favorite lines, however. In every place, she moves in the center and is a radiating point of influence. Women are the guardians of our liberties. And he was also quite forward looking in the entirety of the curriculum, a very strong and broad liberal arts base, but also in his advocacy for the arts, for art, but also for music, which will be an important aspect when we look forward in just a little bit to see how Mary Julia Baldwin picked up on that when she was a student and how she actually drew upon it as a very smart businesswoman to really save the institution. So we go forward from there. If, as you know, Rufus Bailey did only stayed at the seminary for seven years. And there was a very difficult period between the time he left in 1849 and the period when Mary Julia Baldwin agreed to come back and be the principal in 1863. There were six principals in that period. So when she came back at the height of the Civil War, there were six students enrolled in the Augusta Female Seminary. But by the time that she carried us all through that period and through the most difficult period year of the Civil War here in Stanton, which was 1864, and then began really building the, the seminary of the future. She built the brick house uh, where she and Agnes McClung lived until they both died. Agnes came here with her, of course, as her, as her administrator and as her friend and really as the chief co-leader in all aspects of the institution. And then going on to build um, to build Sky High, which is you know kind of located up the hill from where Carpenter is now, and then to obtain uh, the former uh, First Presbyterian Church, you can see here in 1872. So she began to build this small complex of buildings that were the seminary at the time. There are so many of these early images and I study them quite acutely. This one I think is probably the most accurate. It's not grandized and made fancy like some of the other ones that will quickly follow here. I think this is probably what the seminary looked like in, in the late 1860s with the church uh, uh, on the side and you know a really rather plain facade and fence in the front. As the pictures move forward, you can see that there was a facade built on the front of, of the church itself as the chapel became was behind. And that historically, we, we do believe there were two fountains out front. The concrete base of one of them is still here. 
This I think may be of all of them in the into the later 1870s, the really the best depiction so that you can see the center of the original admin building, the two wings that were built, the church, the Presbyterian church, the chapel meaning, and it's, it's on the front. Behind, of course, now already is built by this point, um, Mary Julia Baldwin Memorial Hall and, um, and Hilltop has been purchased and then Sky High is here. Market Street, you can't see running up the other side, but there were a variety of other buildings and Stanton houses there. So I like this one because I think it's also like that first one, pretty accurate. The insides of the buildings at this time, really a lot of foresight in putting in, they call the calisthenics, but an, an exercise room. Also love, this was in Sky High, a really nice art studio. These were actually the parlors where every one of you I'm sure has been through in the ad administration building. And there's the portrait of Roof of Bailey that hangs outside this office right here now. So that's what the parlors looked like in that time. And of course in the chapel, many, many concerts. And this is an important segue to what I think really was the cornerstone of Mary Julia saving and, and the, the school and creating this conservatory of music in 1871, bringing in a lot of German trained professors, an incredibly rigorous curriculum. As a musician, I studied it all. I wrote an article about this in a previous Mary Baldwin magazine. So that was very fully enrolled. You can see the number of graduates finally ending um, in the year of her death with a, a four year baccalaureate degree in music. The Institute was, it was filled with instruments. Most of them she bought herself. In, but So you can see there by 1890, there were two grand pianos, pedal organs and 40 other pianos. And here is the trick. She had a first class music curriculum, but she paid, charged a premium for it. And this was a very significant turning point um, in the finances and in the success of the seminary at the time hundreds of beautifully preserved programs we have in the archives about all of those programs and pictures of the instrumental concerts, of the choir concerts, of smaller groups like ukulele clubs and, and the mandolin orchestra. So a very, very significant period for her um, before the seminary was officially named for her in 1895 and of course before she died in 1897. Professor Hamer was one of the most important professors, a keyboard professor who, that she brought from German conservatories. He stayed on and after her death, there were a number of years in the early 20th century where the identity struggle for the institution went on. Should the seminary be maintained? Should the conservatory be maintained? Should the emerging baccalaureate or you know, sort of more collegiate level be maintained? So the, the first couple centuries, to decades of the 20th century, were pretty difficult, but that certainly led up to the decision to create a four-year college in 1923. It meant that the seminary, the younger students, and the conservatory were phased out as the college was put into place and assumed a little bit more of its modern appearance. And when President Jarman came, he really began to establish the traditions that still drive us now. The commencement here in 1929, you can see exiting admin and still going into the chapel, into the church at that time, beginning the process of investing the seniors on Founders Day. Um, this is a picture from 1934 and then carrying us all the way through the centennial of Mary Baldwin in 1842, where that second history stops, but really pretty much a, a similar appearance to what you might expect today and the difficult years of the Second World War here. So you, they go forward from there, and I put this up for Eisenhower just as a punctuation point, but let me go back because during this period, the late after, um, Jarman died, that was a very unstable period. There was a period where there was a serious merger of Mary Baldwin and Hamden Sidney considered and several interim leaders, but it led up to Dr. Samuel Spencer becoming the president in 1957 and alongside the long already serving Martha Grafton. They, as many of you know, I see you on here, you experienced this beginning of this remarkable period of growth for the institution where many of the main campus buildings were built. And this, this one I like, there's a construction photo for almost all the main buildings, but how the library was constructed. And you're also during this period, of course, Hunt Hall and Woodson, which was the new dormitory and the other new dormitory, which was named for Dr. Spencer. 
and that wonderful stained glass window that the alumni, alumni had given in 1901 and installed. So Market Street was closed. These, this beautiful quadrangle on a hill was created. Enrollment grew. Many of you experienced that. It was an incredibly thriving period. The curriculum, the sense of the liberal arts, a connection internationally, a richness of, inter, of international travel began. A remarkable decade. But when Dr. Spencer left, we plunged into a different period. Um, when Dr. Kelly came in 1969, and then when, when Virginia Lester came, uh, that period was a difficult one. All this infrastructure of the campus had been built. There were a lot of pressures. There were political pressures, obviously. There were changes occurring with single-sex institutions beginning to go co-ed. There was a lot that needed to be done that had to be extremely innovated. And so this was a period, an extended period of time that really went from through Dr. Lester and through much of Dr. Tyson's tenure, first with expanding the campus through the purchase of the Stanton Military Academy in 1976, then the beginning of the adult degree program in 1977. And then of course the program for the exceptionally gifted in 1985. So that was the hinge between um, Dr. Lester, who had the brainstorm for this, but it was Dr. Tyson who really, who really brought this to bear. And these are the first students living in Tullage at the time in the program for the exceptionally gifted. So we had a first graduate program in, in education in 92, and of course the Virginia Women's Institute for Leadership was started in 1995. This was an important period for the establishment of, of the Office of Multicultural Affairs, now the Office of Inclusive Excellence, and a very proud period of extending our mission to a much more diverse and inclusive student body and building on our whole century of theater traditions, which I don't do any justice to in here. I see, see Terry Southerton is on this call, but building on that entire century to the establishment in 2001, of the Shakespeare and Performance Program and our partnership with the American Shakespeare Center. So this is about the time that I, when this was, uh, Shakespeare program was getting started, where I began to, to know about the opportunity for Mary Baldwin. And so I came, as you know, in 2003, and we started immediately with a strategic plan with composing our future. And one of the first important things that that led to was the establishment of the Spencer Center for Civic and Global Engagement, in which we opened in 2007. And I feel extraordinarily blessed to have known Dr. Spencer, Dr. Kelly, Dr. Lester, and that, and Dr. Tyson and I will be hosting a joint dialogue about the 40 years of our leadership in November. So to have known, to have that continuity and to have met Mrs. Grafton and, and to know so many of our amazing professors and leaders here, I feel that hinge of history. And on this day in 2007 with Dr. Spencer, it was just extremely special. So from that period, we started to conceive some new academic programs. The idea of a College of Health Science became um, a feasibility study. We renovated the Peer Science Center, but we really then began this past period of time since 2014 of really innovating forward to the university. So as you know, we opened the Murphy Deming College of Health Sciences in 2014, converted to university at our 175th in 2016, admitted residential men in 2017, building to record enrollment, and this year to pull together a centralized university structure with our new colleges, which I'll highlight in a minute. And so for me, this is a move forward here. In 2023, you will welcome the 10th president of Mary Baldwin. But during this period, a few of my favorite features was the day that uh, Bertie Smith and I met up on that hill and I had said, can you see it? Do you think this is a good spot? And she said, yes, I think it's a wonderful spot. So we have the groundbreaking photos here and the constructions of Murphy Deming and the actual dedication of the facility then. Uh, it opened in on Father's Day in 2014, but the official dedication was in 2015 with a beautiful uh, wall of all the amazing donors, many of you on this call who helped make it possible and then the day where she actually was able to walk in and see the building, which was, which was truly special. Some scenes from the 175th anniversary. 
I love these scenes. They're beautiful. But for those of you who were there with us, it was 97 degrees. <laughs> so it's one thing to remember about that day. As we went up the hill for lunch, Pascal Young, my good friend from Ghana, called us called us to, to meet. We raised the Mary Baldwin University flag, and then we went up to break ground for the renovation of the alumni house. So an incredibly special day. And over this past year, we've really pulled all of these aspects together of this decade of evolution into a stronger marketing and university positioning. You'll be hearing more about pulling all of our student support services and our support services for our, our alumni, the promise of being a university for life together into the McCree Center for Life Success and a consolidation of our academic colleges into three named colleges. We had Murphy Deming, great gratitude to Susan Palmer for her wonderful belief in professional studies that have named and, and endowed this college, which is the center of our online work and a locus of our expansion of our workforce activities. And the Betty Gold, our sculptress on, who has six major sculptures on our campus, um, has named the College of Arts and Science. So these three colleges each have three schools, and each of them have undergraduate and graduate programs, and they also serve residential students and online students. So that's sort of where we've come today. So in that span of history, we pull back for a minute. I want to recenter you in the campus, just in the beauty of it, just take a deep breath and know that we so love these hills where beauty dwells. We love them when it's sunny and beautiful and a clear vista. We love them in the rain. I love this photo. I don't actually seen I've ever I don't think I've ever seen this many umbrellas lined up. But in 1970 in the blue stocking, there were that many umbrellas and then hanging from the lights even. So we love it in the rain. We love it at sunrise over the cupola and over Murphy Deming. We love it at sunset, behind panel, and behind Murphy Deming, so on both of our campuses. So we stop for a minute now. We're going to have some interactive and get your favorite thoughts for the next part of this hour here. So we're going to start with, what is your favorite building? There's a poll. All you have to do is cast your vote there. We realize we didn't list them all with apologies. Grafton and Hines are in a tie. We still have some coming in. <laughs> and Kelly says Rose Terrace. He just did. And Peggy oh. offers up sky high. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're at 75%. So our top two are Grafton at 39% and Hunt at 34. Um, and then we have Deming. Not that many liked Pierce. A few liked the Student Activity Center. And we got a few, we got a few in the other category, right? We got a yes. few in the chat, right? We have a few. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, I see them building. Mm -hmm. yes. Rose Terrace Administration Building. Hilltop. Hilltop. Good. And Devin smartly points out Hunt because that's where the food is. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Oh, okay, Megan. Okay. Let's go on. Okay. I just moved forward, right? This will. Yes. Okay, pass with it. Let's see. Music building when it was across the street, right? Right. It, which is the Miller House now. Incredible building. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. Megan, I'm not able to move my slide. Do you think you have to take the poles down? Let me try uh, down here. Okay, we're good, but the polls are still perfect. there. Perfect. Okay. 
All right, so <laughs> buildings no more. Let's see if you can name some buildings that we don't have anymore on this campus. So, okay. All right, so we're looking behind, maybe you put the pull up pretty early, but behind these oh, lovely okay. women, you see the building and this thing, which we'll talk about in a minute. So what is what is this building? Answers are trickling in. We have a lot of smart alums on the call. <laughs> Well, Megan, it looks like. Uh, oh wait, Shanna's raised her hand. Shanna, do you uh, unmute? Would you like to? Would you like to comment? I'm sorry, I I couldn't see the picture before, so I just did a random guess, and now I can see that my answer is incorrect. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'm sorry. Well, it looks like a okay. majority know that this is sky high in the covered way right now. Is there yeah. anybody on the call? Who actually clattered about from upper from in that covered way? Did anybody was anybody ever in it actually? Unmute and say so if you were. Uh, yes, I, I was. was. I, I was. Cheryl <laughs> was. Cheryl was. was okay. Judy Hatcher was. was. Judy Thompson was. Oh, Judy. Betty Engel and Peggy Engel were. That's right. I remember. So you didn't have to get wet at all. You can come right out of the dorm and go right down there, right? Got it. And between Hilltop and Memorial also. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, the infirmary we see there below Sky High. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. All right, Megan, we have another building. Okay. Oh. Let's see, you'll go forward here. I can get me to my mouse to move. Okay. What is this building? No idea. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, sorry. It's, no, it, no, it's it, okay. It's obviously South Barracks, <laughs> where my where my brother was when I was at Mary Baldwin. Really? Oh, yeah. that's so great. Yeah. And it was, if you don't, I have a picture of it later so you can see that it was, mm -hmm. it was very large and like right in the middle of going now, mm -hmm. uh, like you were walking up um, to where Panel Center is now, right across from what we call Cannon Hill, what they call Flagpole Hill. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's it. That's so, for, for it. And I'm, I'm glad the person spoke up whose brother was in there because it, it when I was at Mary Baldwin, we were not allowed on that campus. Oh, okay. But we had some great uh, snowball fights with the cadets <laughs> up there. There were some snowball fights. I don't know if we were supposed to be up there, but we were. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me switch the poll really quickly. So get prepared. Do you know what this building is or was? It doesn't look like Bailey or McClung, so I'd say Toolage. <laughs> Maybe we don't, we had some hard time getting a picture of this that we're all very happy with actually. Mm -hmm. So the majority do have it, it is Bailey, but it, it, is. It, it is, yes it is. It's a little hard to see it actually mm -hmm. from here. 
So, you know, or is there, there isn't anybody on the call who was actually born in King's Daughters Hospital. Is there a lot of times I'll walk around Stanton and someone will say, I was born in that place, right? <laughs> And Nancy it, it, is raising her hand. She was. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's oh. great. That's great. And it disappeared in the middle of the night. Once I asked Dr. Tyson, how did you, how did you tear that building down? That's a pretty big deal. She said, I didn't tell anybody and I did it in the dark of the night. I don't think that's exactly right, but that's what she said. <laughs> All I right. was the house mother in that building in the sixties. Yeah. Well, not that the front was different. The front we still was had the operating rooms inside, but the front of it was different. That's cool. That's really cool. Maria has a great comment in the chat. Um, I lived in Bailey my first year in 1978. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. It was a great dorm. I loved it. <laughs> and Betsy has a raised hand. Yeah. Oh, yes. I just wanted to say that um, it was known for having the octagonal. Um, operating room mm -hmm. and that was the, actually the neatest dorm room in the whole building yep it was oh. and liz that was my freshman year in south bailey and it was interesting to understand that there were no steps anywhere at that time and so we would walk up the hill in the snow and slide back down after breakfast <laughs> so just put that in perspective there were no stairs <laughs> oh my goodness all right, so now let's test some of your memory on people. Who is this? Looks like the majority have it there, right? That yeah. is indeed Miss McClung. All right. Okay. Everybody will get this. You better, right? Just be a quick one. <laughs> <laughs> they should be nominated for sainthood. Right, I know, right? <laughs> Almost 50 years. And when Ethel Smeek took me to see her for the first time, she wanted to plan my inauguration. I mean, she was not, she didn't, she didn't live that many months after that, but she just, she was, it was amazing to be with her. And Sam Spencer absolutely revered her. He said that he wouldn't have come to Mary Baldwin without Martha Grafton. And then in any other time, since she was acting president four times, she would have been the president of Mary Baldwin College. Remarkable. This should be easy. Yep. <laughs> Yep. So most of you have that. This is this is Jenny Lester. And she was so kind to me. She contacted me very early in my presidency. And, you know, there is a photo that I think you'll see in the upcoming magazine of Dr. Spencer, Dr. Kelly, Dr. Tyson, Dr. Lester and myself on the day of my inauguration. And she kept in touch with me. She lived in Alexandria. And the last time I saw her, she attended the opening dedication of Murphy Deming in the spring of 2015. And she brought to me a paper bag that had two Apple Day t-shirts in it because she said she thought that I, and I have them still. So she was very, <laughs> very kind to me and told me a lot about, about <laughs> her time, which was not without challenges because she had to make a lot of difficult financial decisions. Okay, last one.
All right. Yes, the majority have that. That is Dr. Mm -hmm. Spencer early on in his presidency. You know, he was only 37 years old when he assumed the presidency, came here from Davidson. So really, really remarkable in every way. And I have to say he was such a strong mentor for me. One of the things that I don't think I can give to the archives is after my interview, he was on my presidential search committee. Before the next day after I got home, he must have penned it that night. He sent me a certified letter saying that he hoped that I would come to Mary Baldwin and that there would be somebody to help me the way Martha Grafton helped him. So he just was really, really super special. Okay, so how well do we know our rich history? Here is a little quiz. So the first one is in the, eight, in the 1940s, one's present at a church service of one's choice on Sunday was required, as was attendance at College Chapel three times a week. True or false? Megan, you're going to answer these, right? Yes. So we're at 88%, and this is a tricky one. It is actually false because you had to go five times. <laughs> so the 8%, the four of you who answered false, you are correct. <laughs> Little bit of a trick question, right? Little trick. Little trick. And apparently still required in the 60s, according to the chat. <laughs> yes. Yes, I can't see the chat, but I was going to say, well, this little rule thing is coming in. Feel free to post up the rules that you had or the ones that annoyed you the most. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Megan, there's another. Okay. Before 1945, it was required that all students go to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that was before those eight betas came in, of course, in the 1950s. Almost at 75%. Do you ask more people want to submit their answers? And the answer is? True. True. So good job. <laughs> okay. Apple Day was originally called Old Girls Picnic. Oh, thanks. Okay, Megan, the answer is true. That true. is what it was originally called and evolved over the years. Okay. Let's see, do we have one more here? Yes. Yes. The first capstone festival was held on in 2004. Well, this one must be a tricky one. We had some answers come in and then we've hit a pause. And the answer is? It is false. That so was a tricky question, you know. The, the year was 2006 was when the first capstone was held. So close, close, Very close, close, close. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Okay. Okay, last one. In the 2010s, freshman students had to earn weekend vis visitation through cumulative hall GPA. Every student on the hall had to hit a certain GPA before you could have male visitation. Okay. 
We're going to want to let the one who lived it answer this in a minute. I, uh, <laughs> I was going to call on Amber to give the answer in a second. <laughs> Okay, hey, Amber, what was the answer? Oddly enough, it is true. We all had to band together to get um, one weekend a month out of the fall semester, as long as our cumulative GPA was high enough. Um, and then we all chose which weekend it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. I think we go to a few fun ones. We had to announce man on the hall when our fathers came to move us in or come we get us. We still did that in the 2000s, too. <laughs> well, speaking of man on the hall, in 1945, a date was defined as a walk downtown with a male companion, a conversation for 45 minutes, dinner and a movie, or 15 minutes. <laughs> Getting a little bit in every column here. We are. We all have different definitions of what a date is. <laughs> if there were a historical timeline about what you could or couldn't do after Mrs. Patch and when you could be on the porch and where you could dance, <laughs> there's really, it's, it is pretty complicated. Looks like the answers have stopped coming in. So I think we can call it. The answer is D, a conversation with a young man for more than 15 minutes. That's a date. That's a date. Wow. That's a date. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Last one here. African-American women were admitted to Mary Baldwin in which year? Looks like the answers have stopped coming in. The correct answer is C, 1964. Mm -hmm. And Lily Little was the first African-American woman to come to Mary Baldwin. Okay, so just take a, take a little pause for the season here, and then we're going to have some seasons. So just every season is so special. It's a new year, new possibilities every fall. Then I have to say it's dark now, but today these leaves are approaching this level of beauty here. They're just absolutely gorgeous. And we our fall, of course, starts now with a newer tradition from 2007 on the eve of the first day of classes, which is the convocation and candle lighting tradition. And then, as we saw earlier, our long tradition of Apple Day. Here are the pictures all across the ages and through the similar scenes. There's 45 and 55 and 1960 and 1975. And then just showing the similarity there on the in the Mary Baldwin's own orchard and on the left and now where we go. And there was a hiatus in attending and gleaning apples that I really wanted to bring back in 2005. So the students were so clever to find the photo for which we I think is from 1963 on the left. If there's anybody here who was on that ladder or knows about this, I think that's right and then actually recreate it when we went back to the orchard so that that was very special. And these traditions have obviously continued. This is last year's return to the orchard and this year where I showed you earlier here where we were saying happy birthday to Mary Julia. Carnival still very much enjoyed in the afternoon. It was a little bit cloudy yesterday, but they had a great time. This weekend, we're going into family weekend. There will be some events, sporting events, v will parades. And now junior dads, or as it's called the junior ring ceremony actually occurs in October at family weekend. 
So that will be happening this weekend. And all those pumpkins we brought back will be gearing up for the pumpkin carving. Dan says it's the biggest and best, so stay tuned. And all of the beautiful leaves. I looked out my window here this afternoon and saw ham and jam shining through those leaves. The wonderful class bell with the beautiful foliage behind it. Times that everybody today, students were sitting on the lawn. Uh, you, you sat on the lawn. Students have always sat on the lawn. And Liz, you sat on the lawn. <laughs> Are you still here, Liz? Say something, I'm only I'm here. Do you remember? Do you remember, Dr. Fox? Do you remember when you showed me we were at a board meeting? Do you remember this? We were at a board meeting, you were new. And you came in and you put down the new program, the new thing that and there I was. And, and I'm going, uh, excuse me. And you just looked at me and you said, evidently, we didn't get your permission. <laughs> I didn't ask your permission tonight either, but it's a, such a nice picture. Of you me. are so dear. What a <laughs> God bless you, lady. God bless you. So Dan took a series of photos of every season. So this is his photo looking toward the west behind panel. And then that very same theme in the winter oh, when wow. we love all of our idyllic snow scenes, particularly of Hunt. Here's Murphy Deming with snow looking down our main row of buildings there and way back when building a large snow squirrel or now more commonly sledding down the hill all the iterations of christmas cheer and now if you look in the up in the upper right corner murphy deming has their own finals week version of murphy Murph, of christmas cheer and they do their decorating and going through our cultural uh, las posadas Kwanzaa, and into spring, where of course the campus is extremely beautiful, these tulips up by the sack, the blossoms with the cupola standing majestically behind them, spring fling with, with this May Day, but I missed, wait a minute, I missed the previous, okay, here it is, this slide skips over. So the May Day tradition doesn't exactly go on anymore but they have occasionally had um, a Maypole tradition at Spring Fling, but that's one tradition we don't carry forward. In the spring, we always have Relay for Life, and I put this in because this is my dad right here on the right side um, with Relay for Life. And then of course, there were great days to lay outside and sunbathe or fly a kite <laughs> on Cannon Hill or study in May term lots of May term trips or May term here, uh, recovering and saving our, rip, our middle river and then using the recovered plastic to make beautiful artwork during May term. Then followed by the Capstone Festival, which has really become an exceptional display of oral talent, of scientific experiments, of art, as you can see here in the gallery. And then the traditions old and new, still the same for commencement, whether processing from admin into First Presbyterian or the more recently, and here you can see that Pierce is being built um, in that photo in the, uh, in the top uh, during that commencement to our more recent commencement, commencements on Page Terrace and decorating. This is last year. We had just had a very joyous time being able to return to in-person commencement and they're allowed to decorate their hats again. So these are some of the best hats <laughs> from 2022. And then just a quick tour through all of our sports that have been so central to us, our sports of the present, so our men's and women's tennis, our women's volleyball. Um, we do have men's and women's soccer. We have men's and women's basketball. We have men's and women's track and cross country. We have baseball. And let's see, I thought there was one more. You know, that's good pictures of the baseball team. So out of all that, we're coming to the, to the end here, but just a few more questions. So what is your favorite tradition? Megan, you got a poll here, right? And if, if, you, if it's not on there, put, put your preference in the chat. Apple day. Yeah. Apple cool. day. Of course. I knew that. Do they still offer golf? We took golf at Ingleside. 
we don't. It's funny you mentioned that because a couple of students were asking me about golf, a couple, both men and women a couple of weeks ago, but we haven't been offering it, no. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like we have some who are answering by um, our poll. Clearly the winner is Apple Day followed by the junior dad ring ceremony. And then we have Christmas cheer, um, then tied with Kwanzaa and signature ball. And I see a whole bunch are coming in through the chat. Yeah, and Johnny graduation. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Putting on a musical in second year. Yeah. And singing the class songs. Right. And this one that um, just came into the chat is something I learned with the Saw MBU chapter the other night, that Apple Day used to be a surprise and yes. announced mm -hmm. the night before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a junior class president, it was I was the one in on surprise and made the uh, announcement the night before. And you Ellen, you have always. your hand up. So we, it's almost eight, but I, I'd rather maybe not. We had some other polls, but I'd rather actually ask a couple of the of the final questions I had. I had some faculty members here. We can let's just do a couple of them. So you know the the constancy of the classroom and your faculty being absolutely the heart of everything that you do here, older science or more recent science. So you probably know the answer to this right off, correct? You know who this is. Yep. <laughs> there might be a clear winner. <laughs> There's a clear winner on this one. <laughs> yep. So that is mm -hmm. definitely Jim Lott, as you can see here. So I'd like to stop there um, and I might actually stop the share because I'd like to have just some, some closing um, sharing of uh, maybe the first three or four people of your favorite professor and then to return to my opening question, what does Mary Baldwin's rich history mean to you? So who, hands up, who'd like to share a favorite, favorite professor, really moving classroom experience? Judy Looks like and Sheer and Liz. Yeah. Okay. In that order. You're good. Dr. Andrew Mahler, English professor, wonderful man. Mm. Was okay. he hard grader? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Maybe, but he had heart mm -hmm. and he, he had expression and with huge hands in huge hands. hands. <laughs> yeah. Dr. James McAllister in the religion and philosophy department. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Dr. Ulysse Deport. Ulysse, what it was uh, when I knew him, he was just an incredible, perplexing character. Was he the same when he? <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he was. He a, was a. He was he a. Was hoot. A, hoot. <laughs> a hoot is right. That's right. Yeah. I, I'd say I, Dr. Mink. Dr. In the history department. She was mm -hmm. fantastic, mm -hmm. um, inspiring, and you learn so much from her all the time. She was wonderful. Mm -hmm. I had Ethel Smeek for English and um, did a uh, interpretation of Lita and the Swan, and I got a C, and I wanted to ask her about that, and um, she told me uh what it meant and of course it was about sex and i had gone in that direction with my interpretation and so beautifully and wonderfully i explained why i'd say what i said and i said how do you know that's what he meant that was way way before we were even born and she looked at me and she said you're exactly right go with your interpretation and gave me a better grade uh -huh. so from that moment on I understood that it was okay to talk to a professor and disagree and understand and learn together. It saved my life academically, showing me I'm not an idiot. And I've loved Mary Ballin ever since. Great. She was amazing. Maria? 
Um, I would say for me as an art history major and business minor, Dr. Eccles and Dr. Deport, because I took so many of their classes. And as a result of, you know, what they taught me, it, it um, prompted me to study abroad in, in my junior year or half of my junior year in London. And I, I loved that. And then I would also say Dr. William Bartarella. Now he was not very, there very long, but he taught, um, he taught business management and advertising. And I, you know, that helped me, I guess the combination of the history and working in Dr. Bartarella prompted me to get into advertising after um, Mary Baldwin and eventually into marketing. So those are my three professors. And of course, Dr. Mink, because Dr. Mink, Dr. Mink, right? <laughs> Thank you. And Janie Satterfield had her hand up. Hello. Um, Coach Betty Hagley was mm. dear to me and is still dear to me. Um, she was a wonderful coach and just a great person to be around. Mm -hmm. I see some few, in the chat too. Yeah, we've got some in the chat here. Dr. Barbara Eli, Eli. Mm -hmm. Dr. Marbell in organic chemistry, Dr. Stanley in American foreign affairs, Frank Southerington, Shakespeare, Dr. Carl Broman, music appreciation. And looks like um, Dr. Mary E. Humphreys, biology. Judy has her hand up. Yeah. How can I forget Dr. Bryce? Dr. Dr. Bryce. Bryce. English. How? Oh, <laughs> So, so uh, just a couple of you. What is? I don't know how. How if I've hit upon the aspects of Mary Baldwin history that are dear to you, but. What does Mary Baldwin history mean to one or two of you? It means something to everybody, but perhaps something slightly different. Well, you didn't mention the parents council and that's, I think that's new since I was there, but it's just the history brings involvement and initiative and tradition, it just blends it all and makes these lifelong friendships possible with the teacher student ratio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Ellen, I see your hand is raised. I think you're muted, Ellen. Okay. Hope and value getting four years of solid academic training, a well rounded liberal arts education, and I greatly feel the school through its history has given a population of students a good foundation when, and it's a population that actually there were not that many places those students could get this mm -hmm. um, and I hope it continues in that that's what I value solid academics thank you Ellen Finley did you have your hand up I did well yeah. go ahead is it, this is Judy Gray? Um, Judy. <laughs> I, I think from, you know, I think I, I probably say once a week what a wonderful education I got at Mary Baldwin. And I was going to say that Dr. Bill Kimball was one of my favorite professors because I came to Mary Baldwin. I had never written a term paper. I had a horrible high, high school education in Norfolk. And he gave me D's and F's the entire first semester. He put my paper up on the board on the you know the big thing that everybody could see the grade and he was always nice about it but he had the class in hysterics reading my reading my papers and I drew him for sophomore English and at the end of the sophomore year I was I was making 
making A's. And Pamela, you know that I did a lot of writing for Mary Baldwin. And a lot of that was because Dr. Kimball was really, he really taught me how to write. And I made a lot of my living writing. And I think about him and I think about my education there because I grew up at Mary Baldwin. Mm -hmm. right. Betty wanted to add, Betty Stoddard wanted to add as well. She was trying to raise her hand. You can just talk, Betty. It's okay. <laughs> I can't hear her. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Oh, okay. I wanted to say that as my grandmother and my mother and two aunts went there. So it's very special to me it's, that I got to go there too. It's just a, and the grandmother who went there, had, I have a piece of paper that she signed, that's signed by Mary Julia Baldwin. So that's pretty special. That's pretty yeah. special. It goes, yeah. goes back a long way. Yeah. So I've enjoyed this evening. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. And, and I would like to say, President Fox, this is just what a, what a treasure to have this evening and, and hear people speak and, and to have the history for you. I want to get my hands on all those books. I have read Ms. Minx, but I haven't read, read the others. And, and the history for me and, and my sister Betty is here also. Um, our mom went to Mary Baldwin and our cousins went to Mary Baldwin and we were a Presbyterian family. And it was, it was the, I was never given a choice <laughs> and I'm glad I wasn't because today when I say I went to Mary Baldwin, I almost always find someone else around me who is either gone or their child is gone. And my grandson's best friend is playing baseball in Mary Baldwin now, which just really delights me. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's fabulous. And he loves it. He absolutely loves it. That's wonderful. And I like this. Uh, thank you for that. And Amy says, I use the word transformational when I talk about Mary Baldwin. I completely agree. I think that is just a wonderful continuity of our mission. So, well, I just feel so privileged to have been here with you tonight and just to, to share a little bit about the history, but mostly to hear hear how you connect to it and to know what a difference it made for you and to know what a difference it's going to make going forward. So please join our other events with me and Dr. Tyson in November. Please come back. So we'll have some different conversations indeed, but God bless you all. I love being with you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's wonderful. Thanks for the Vivaldi at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was fun. Mike dropped. <laughs> Dr. Fox, did you see Lena?